Hello, my name is Jason Kendall and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Today we're starting the discussions about light. Light, that thing that comes from the stars and comes to us and that allows us to see things. So what is light? Well, I'm going to get to the history about that in, the, in a later episode, probably the next one, but what I'm going to do now is just pause it to you and tell you what the current state of thinking is about light. Well, we need to actually understand what we mean by this thing called light, and we're going to discuss it in a certain framework. All right, the first way we're going to discuss things is about there's, there's two natures to light and the current way of thinking about things. Light can be exhibited both as a particle and as a wave. So what does that mean? Okay, well, waves are things that are phenomena in a, in a medium of some sort and we think of water waves as a good way of looking at it. But let's actually take a step back and say that we have a lot of evidence that tells us that light behaves in a manner like waves. And I'll discuss the history of that next time. But let's actually mean, look at what we mean by waves and what are waves and so forth. Well, light has frequencies, light has wavelengths, light goes at a specific speed. So let's actually put all that together. Well, when we look at the nature of what light is, there are versions of light that we call visible light, and that's the light that we see with our eyes. It's an extraordinary narrow uh, set of wavelengths from about 4,000 angstroms to about 7,000 angstroms, but yet light can have many wavelengths from extraordinarily short, much shorter than 4,000 angstroms to extremely much longer than 4,000 angstroms, even to up to a mile or so. So the wavelengths of light can be as small as the smaller than the diameter of a nucleus of an atom to larger than a mountain. And they're all light. So what is this thing that we call light anyway? Well, we'll call it electromagnetic radiation. So anything that is light, that is electromagnetic radiation, of which light, which we call visible light, is a very, very small part. So electromagnetic radiation is this thing we call light at any wavelength, at any frequency, not just the visible light. All right. So wave phenomena, what's a frequency, what's a wavelength, et cetera. Well, what's wave motion? So a wave motion, we can start with the idea that maybe we have a surface like a pond or something, and maybe we've got a nice little pond, and then somebody drops a rock into the pond, and that causes a wave to propagate outward. So a wave can be propagated by, as a propagating disturbance in a medium. So, the wave propagates to the right, away from where the rock went into the water. But basically, this pattern of waves, maybe it's not like a continuous wave. Maybe it's just a, maybe it's just a brief piece of a wave. Right? So we have the water wave now. We drop the rock into the water, into the still water, and it makes a pulse. Right? And that pulse then travels this way. And that's what we see when we think about water waves. It like drops into water, and it pulses and travels to the right. But let's now posit that instead of a rock, maybe we dip a, dip a stick into the rock, that maybe like a stick with a ball in it, or maybe this. You take your fist and you just slowly go up and down into the water and make a continuous set of waves, or just tap the surface of water with, with your finger. And you can do the same thing. So then what do we get? Well, the disturbance in the water then looks more like this, right? It has peaks and valleys and peaks and valleys. Now, if your finger touches it, say, one time each second, well, that's the frequency with which you touch it. So the frequency, there's three things that we're going to talk about with respect to wave motion. We're going to talk about the frequencies. There, there goes the shock. There goes the frequency. We're going to talk about their wavelength. And we're going to talk about their speeds. So there's three things. The first thing is frequency. So let's say in this example, we touch the surface of the water one time each second. Then the frequency of that interaction will be one touch per second. So frequency has units of number of actions per second. So maybe we have one touch per second. Maybe you're really twitching it, like, a hundred, like 10 times a second, right? So these are 10 times per second. 10 times what? 10 touches. Maybe 10 rocks are falling into the water every second. Maybe 10 automobiles are falling into the water every second. Those would be big waves. Ah, but really, leads to another fourth thing we have to look at is amplitude, too. Amplitude. Because, you know, I just described something which will give different amplitudes. 
So frequency, speed, and wavelength are all, are, are all, are all, all set up together. So now, what's the wavelength? Well, the wavelength is dependent upon the speed. So let's say we touch the water one time each second, and that wave goes out with a very, very long wavelength. Maybe the wavelength is extraordinarily, maybe it's a foot, right? So maybe the wavelength is one foot, right? Wavelength is measured in distance, is a distance. But what is the distance of wavelength? Well, the wavelength is the distance between two consecutive peaks. So we'll call that the wavelength. And the wavelength frequently uses the Greek letter gamma. So, or lambda, I'm sorry. Lambda is our wavelength, or W, but frequently lambda. Uh, frequency uses the Greek letter nu, like, oh, I knew you were coming, or, G oh, that's not a small moose, that's a nu. Uh, actually, gnu is G-N-U, and nu is K-N-E-W, but this Greek letter nu is just N-U. So the Greek letter nu describes frequency, the Greek letter lambda describes wavelength, and frequencies are always something per second, and distance is a wavelength, so it could be meters or yards or miles or whatever. Frequencies can be per hour, too, if you want, but frequently we're not going to use that. We're going to almost always use seconds as our time interval. So then we can make a speed out of them, because the speed of the wavelength depends on how long, how fast the, wave is, the peaks of the wave are traveling to the right. So let's assume they're traveling that way. So the speed, then, with which they're traveling is simply equal to the wavelength times the frequency, or lambda times nu. So that will be something. So we could say, what's the wavelength? One meter. What's the frequency? One uh, cycle per second. So what is a cycle? Well, oh, wait. Ah, what do we mean by frequency, then, in this diagram? Well, free wavelength says, what is the distance between peaks? And the frequency then says how fast, how often per second the, the, the whole cycle occurs. So from here to here, or from here to here, what is the time interval? And time interval of travel. So we could say maybe it takes one second for that to travel. Maybe it takes a tenth of a second. Maybe it takes uh, a thousandth of a second. Maybe it takes a year. Mm, those would be long wavelengths or at least very slow speeds of waves. So the wavelength is this distance and times the time gives you the speed with which the wave is traveling through the medium. So that's kind of what we're thinking about. Now amplitude is different. So what is amplitude? Amplitude is this. Is it a big wave or a little wave? And so big waves have high amplitude. So this would be a low amplitude, this would be a high amplitude. Amplitude is the height of the wave displaced from the medium. So, so let's, just fit, let's say the, the lake is extremely glassy, right? And it's just really flat. And you drop a little pebble in. The amplitude from the wave is going to be low from the pebble. Now you, take, uh, you drop a really big rock in from a very high altitude, on a cliff or something and like uh, some beautiful places where I've seen that. Anyway, you drop the rock off the cliff, you make a really big wave. So the big amplitude versus the little amplitude depends on the force of the disturbance that you push into it. So there are four basic things, although there is no relationship necessarily between the frequency, wavelength, and speed and the amplitude. The amplitude is separate from it, but, in, but part of it. So these three are related, but the amplitude isn't necessarily related to those. So, in fact, it frequently isn't. You don't have to have a relationship between them. But that's our basic relationships uh, of wave motion. So a wave can propagate through water. It can propagate through air. How, you, how you're hearing me is that as I speak, my vocal folds change in speed, and they push on the air, and the air is compressed. So it's a compressional wave that reaches from me to the microphone, and therefore we get well, you hear sound. Sound doesn't have a medium that goes like this. It's a pressure wave going towards you, so it's a little like, like car pressure. Another example of a wave motion is if you drive down a highway, and cars are not uniformly distributed on a highway. Cars tend to bunch up, so we can look at those as density waves, and how far are they apart? Well, you can probably find if you fly in a helicopter that waves of cars or groups of cars are separated maybe by half a mile or a mile or a, few, a kilometer if you wish. 
So they tend to be separated. And then when you speed up and go through the empty part, you get to the bot back side of a density wave, you have to slow down and go through it. But the density pockets drive as a, uni uh, uh, as a unit. So we can look at lots of different things that approximate wave motion. Now, this all leads to a really fascinating set of ideas. Because when we look at light, there's a lot of reasons to think that there's wave motion to light. So one of the earliest difficulties that people had with respect to light is what's the medium for light? Because we know that, well, in air, a sound travels through air. And if there's a vacuum, sound doesn't travel through it because there's no, nothing, no atoms for it to press upon. So if there's no atoms to push against, then there's no sound wave, there's no pressure wave. If there's no pressure wave, there's no sound, and you don't hear anything. So what about sound waves that happen in, in, by hitting a surface? Okay, when I hit the surface of the chalkboard, what happens is, is that the, way, the chalkboard itself vibrates, and if you were to touch the wall on the far side, you'd actually feel the motion of it. So there's a sound vibration that goes through it, and that's partly compression, but mostly, translate, uh, mostly because it's on the surface here, it would feel more of an up and down thing. So actually the chalkboard itself vibrates a little bit when I hit it. If I hit it too strong, then I make a hole, but otherwise I make a little vibration. So wave motion happens in a flexible medium or some sort of elastic medium that comes and goes and will re restore to itself. So what is the elastic medium of light? It became an incredibly important historical question. But to summarize uh, what we really want to look at for the, for the nature of light as we know it, we know that light has a wavelength and that wavelength has a, has a frequency. But the funny thing is, is that for all light, specifically in a vacuum, but if you go to different media, it has different speeds. But the speed of light in a vacuum, we call by the letter C. So frequently when you talk about speeds of, of wave motion, you use the letter C. And if you study other areas of physics, you'll also see this, but it'll probably be, tend to be C uh, sub S, which would be sound speed or maybe other kinds of speeds. But the speed of light universally across all the physics is labeled with the letter C. And this has a unique value. It has a unique value of about, of, of approximately 300,000 kilometers per second. All light does in a vacuum. So this is a unique value. So it's approximately that. It's a little bit less than, it's like 299, but, but we can round it to 300,000. You can look it up, I'll put it up over here, or, or show you where it on the, on the Wiki page. But about 300,000 kilometers per second. And for those of you that must do miles, it's 186,000 miles per second. That's a lot. So 186,000 miles, well that's just a little bit short of going to the moon. I mean, the moon's about 210,000 miles away. So the moon takes light takes a, just over a second to get to the moon. So if you want to talk to somebody on the moon, you have to wait a second. You can send them the message, they wait a second, they get the message, and then when you want to get a response, let's say you just say, give me a response right now. You've got a computer there, it turns around and gives you a response really quickly, called a transponder. So the computer turns around and gives you a response. You'll get a response in about two seconds. Send a response, get it back in two seconds. That's the fastest you can get information to and back from the moon. Well, the moon is approximately uh, one light second away. That's what we mean. That's as far as light travels in a second, so the moon's about one light second away. But that speed is universal, which means that the speed of light is equal to its wavelength times its frequency. Now, typically in an intro level textbook, they won't use the Greek letters, and you might see W times F where wavelength is W and F is frequency. But it's the same thing. So the frequency times the wavelength is the speed of light, which means that for all light, if the wavelength is long, the frequency is low. And if the wavelength is short, the frequency is high. Because the wave travels at the same speed, no matter the frequency, no matter the wavelength. That's not true of all things. Not all things have the same wavelength dependency in the medium. So 
different things travel at different speeds, and in fact, if you look at the speed of sound in water, as opposed to the speed of sound in air, you find something different. The speed of sound, say, in a chalkboard is different than that in air, and the speed of sound uh, in, in, a, in any solid body is much, much shorter than that in air. So, these are our basics with respect to uh, wave motion. And, um, well, there's one other thing I should notice about the nature of wave motion in physical media. Notice when I hit the board, did the board move left and right? No, it didn't shift that way. It flexed up and down as, the, as it moved across. There might have been some compression, but effectively the atoms and molecules didn't really move much from their position. The wave itself, the propagation of the wave moved, but the objects inside of there didn't like permanently shift to the right or permanently shift to the left. So it's not the objects moving, it's the shape is the wave itself. So if, you had a, if this is a water wave again, and we go back and we think, okay, let's look at this as a water wave, not light, but let's just look at it as water. And if we look at a water wave, we say, all right, we got the water, and we got a duck. And a duck is, we'll have a terrible drawing of a duck. There's his wings, there's his head, there's his little tail, everything like that. He's, a, he's an ugly duck. I mean, he's a, like a water rat. I don't know what it is. So as it comes along, the uh, wave pushes the duck up and goes, pushes the duck down. So the duck, through time, will go up and down and up and down, but won't move left and right as the wave pushes it. Now, if the wave has a steep enough gradient, yes, it might push the duck with it. But a gentle, simple waves like these, watch the pond with a duck in it. The duck simply goes up and down and doesn't get pushed by the wave. That's different than a surfer. A surfer then tries to ride and stay in this location of the wave and stay with the wave. But the surfer is falling down at the same rate as the, as, the, as the wave goes to the right. So that's how a surfer stays with the wave. The surfer falls down the front at the same rate as the wave goes forward. So you need a fast moving wave that's very steep so you can stay on the wave. So really the surfer is falling down the wave. It's just the wave is moving along at the same rate that he's falling, which is really interesting. So the duck though, in a very quiet pond, will simply go up, and down and up and down as the wave passes under him. So the wave goes across, the duck goes up and down, and the wave motion goes by. So it's actually a disturbance in the medium of the water and not something it pushes. Even with the surfer, the disturbance moves. Most of the water doesn't really move, it just simply moves up and down. So the surfer is actually using the slope of the of the of the slope of the wave to actually propel him, rather than the motion of the water. Now, it's not different as the surf breaks. Once it breaks, then there's forward motion, and it curls around. But the water itself doesn't move that much when, a wave, when waves pass through. It just simply cycles around in circles. That's how it works. So when we think about it, we have these three fundamental things about waves. We have their frequency, which is how many peaks go by you per second. We have the wavelength, which is the distance between the peaks. We have the speed with which they're traveling, with which the waves travel by you. And for light, it is a constant thing. It is always the product of the wavelength times the frequency, and that's about 300,000 kilometers per second. That's a constant for, for a vacuum. And finally, we have the amplitude of the wave, or how high the waves are as they pass by you. Those are the fundamental properties of wave motion. And as we look at light, we'll see how they apply in other ways. All right, we'll see you next time.